Okay, it's seven o'clock. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the Cut Digital. Um, throughout the talk, I'd like to ask you to kindly keep your cameras and microphones off. Um, we're going to have 10 minutes questions with Derek at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat function and I'll address them at the end of the interview. Okay, so we will get started. Joe, are you there? Um, this evening I'd like to welcome Derek Morris. Derek is a sculptor influenced by the craftsmanship of his upbringing. Derek trained in fine art at Newcastle University and later went on to develop a successful degree course in sculpture at Norwich School of Art. As well as many other things, Derek was also president of the Royal Society of Sculptors for about five years. So Derek, uh, very warm welcome this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we'll start um, at the beginning of your career. And I'd just like you to, you to tell us a little bit about your upbringing and perhaps how this has influenced um, the, the beginnings of the way you started to work. Yes, of course. Um, I, I guess I was very fortunate to grow up in a family. Uh, I had an elder sister, um, so two children, mother and father, um, and looking back, the influence that they had, all of them, on me and what I did later on was quite extraordinary. Um, my father was a craftsman sculptor who had gone to art school at the age of 12 in Birmingham, where he studied art, maths and English. And by the age of 15, he was a good enough draftsman to be employed by the Birmingham Guild, which is one of the old guilds of the arts and crafts movement, um, basically working in bronze casting. Um, he very quickly moved on uh, because he could model as well. He moved on to modeling patterns for all sorts of different things. Um, by the time I really remember him, when I was six or seven, he'd given up working for them. He was working on his own in a very derelict shed <clears throat> at our house where everything happened. Um, and he, he was just the most extraordinary craftsman and did many different things. And I learned from him an interest in materials and an interest in making really from a very early age. My sister was is 10 years older than me. She went to the Royal College where she was the first woman to do silversmithing. Right. Um, and so again, she is hugely skillful in the crafts where, craftsmanship way. And my mother was an embroideress and a weaver. So it was ridiculous, really. I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't escape from all that. Yeah, surrounding. Um, so yes, that was, that was how it all began, really. Thank you. Um, Joe, if we could share the first slide. Could you tell us about this piece and where you were when you made it? This one of the things my father did on the side, um, because he he loved sculpture, he he made several very fine um, portrait heads of different people, including my sister. I don't think he did one of me. Um, we got one or two small um, versions of babies. One of my, our eldest daughter, we have a little head, life size head that he did. Um, and it, it, consequently, there was a point in my life, probably around about 17 and a half, 18, just before I went off to university, where I decided I needed to have a go. And this was my best friend, um, David Whiteman. So this is a plaster that's been colored to look like bronze. And so a beginning, really. Mm, thank you. This is just something thinking about color I this was something I did at school in the sixth form um, and also showed very early an interest in abstract and abstraction really it's of no significance other than um, 
it it helped me to move forward in the way I thought about things. Mm. Thank you. And we'll move to the next slide, please, Joe. Um, this is a standard life model, um, second year at university, a life size, uh, eventually cast in cement fondue, which cement fondue was the magic material of the moment. It was, um, it's a kind of cement, but it sets very quickly uh, and you can, it's very dark colored, so you can actually patinate it. And it's, it's uh, lots of sculptors used it at that time. And did you make uh, this one from, from life? Yes, I, I actually model this in front of the life model. We, did you do drawings first as well? Would you draw? Um, yeah, yes. Um, not a lot of drawings. Um, and of course, when you do something like this, you have to build an armature to hold the clay. So it's, um, it's quite an involved process, really. Making the, the mould in plaster of Paris is quite complicated. So <laughs> it's all very much part of this business of using materials to make three-dimensional things in space, really. Thank you. We'll move to on to the next slide as well. Okay, this is um, a photograph of my um, final show at Newcastle, where you can see a number of different influences at work. Um, in the background, there is a torso, uh, which was made from um, rubbish plaster, uh, which had got bits in it. So when I filed it down with um, with a riffler, you got holes and pits, and it was very romantic in its finish. Um, way in the background in the corner were a couple of little wood carvings, which were done in my first year. But the most important things, obviously, with the plaster turned pieces, and on the left, the carving in Hollywood, made from Hollywood and they were influenced and the, the black object in the middle was cast in in resin and co colored black and my influence then was largely um, Jeanne Arp, Hans Arp who I wrote my uh, dissertation on in the end. Mm -hmm. this, this exhibition gave me an extra year study. I, I gained a Hans scholarship from this and so I had another they didn't give me a degree at this stage. I had an, another year to go and finally got a first and um, went to Chelsea for a year, which would have been erased by Kenneth Roundtree, who was professor, and Mary Webb went there too for a year. And then I was invited back to Newcastle to be a studio demonstrator. And I worked in Newcastle in the university for two years before I finally left. Mm -hmm. The works on the walls as well, that's your, your artwork. Um, yes, um, the, I, of course I can't point things out, but the, the, the little relief of the three on the right is actually a relief of the turned bits of wood cut up, cut. And um, so there was sort of little inklings of the way I might think later on. Mm -hmm. And did you start to explore um, found objects? I think that's something that started to interest Yes, you. I did. Um, hence the, um, the piece with the wheel, which, and then on top are just two pieces of found wood that have been fixed together. Um, I was intrigued by objects, discarded objects, and they, for a while, influenced what I did. Thank you. I think we've got a nice picture of this one. Um, that you were just talking about the wheel. If we move on to the next image. Yes, here, here we are. And um, the, the plaster bits are made with a thing called a strickle, which is um, a box, <laughs> difficult to explain. It's got a, a blade cut from aluminium in the, the, with the silhouette of the, say the circle, and you turn plaster against that. And so you end up with a three dimensional object. And um, I loved that idea that the edge 
of the cutter was a drawing at the edge of the form, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so um, later on, I'm not sure whether there's one, but a piece um, where I renovated an old lathe in the college and made some pieces that are, were made out of turned wood. Um, th these were influenced by Sophie Tauber Arp. She, she did some wonderful things with turned wood puppets and things and I, I, I liked very much the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of the forms that she made. I've always loved her work and was um, captivated by the recent show that she had at Tate Modern. Lovely, thank you. And the next image is a slightly different way of working and looking at form as well. I think I think this was just something one does at college. It was it was an exercise. I think we we you know we learned how to weld, a bit of forging. Um, you can see the influence of um, Gonzales and Picasso there because one doesn't quite know what one's doing at that stage. So um, working inside. The space that's there really not very large probably two feet high and we mentioned before that kind of starting to look at the internal space as well as yes yes yeah. um moving on to the next slide um, i love uh, the 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 working behind these pieces um there's this one and another one that was a a staircase, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, if you could tell us about these wonderful pieces. Um, this was made during the time I was studio demonstrator. I mean, um, typically at Newcastle, they um, all staff were given studio spaces to work. So, which led to um, not a terribly satisfactory teaching thing, because staff were quite often busy in their studios, but I mean, the plan was that a student would come and talk to you in your space and um, and then you would go and talk to them. Anyway, this was made, I think, in the first year of my studio demonstratorship. I'd become very intrigued by um, polyester resin and what you could do with it. This had come from seeing um, works by Philip King, which totally, entranced me, um, um, Tralala and others. Um, and what the base of this is, is a piece of old roll top desk lid, which I found in the skip, which if you stood it on end, you could turn it into, um, you could move it around until it began to form something. And I stiffened it with resin and then it added on the rest as it cast and added it until it became a sculpture. And obviously the bit on the top was made completely separately, but it's it couldn't have existed without me finding that bit of um, roll top desk really. Mm. And the other piece that you found, um, was it a found staircase? Mm. Unfortunately, we don't have an image. I don't think we have an image. That was, it was a, a, a quite a large piece of staircase that turned the corner. Um, and, and again, I stiffened it and added pieces with resin and ended up with quite a large freestanding piece that um, spread across the ground, really. Again, um, quite influenced by the thinking behind uh, Philip King's work. Mm. Uh, uh, talk about Philip King, what was it in there that um, really um, inspired? I, I thought <clears throat> seeing what was happening um, <clears throat> coming out of St Martin's, of course, was the powerful influence of Caro. Um, Philip King was a colleague of, of Caro's and has made very substantial steel works too, but he went through a period early on of exploiting um, the possibilities of, of resin, um, casting it and molding it and working on the surface of it. Um, and it produced 
of sculptural objects, the like of which I'd never seen before, and I don't think anybody else had seen. Uh, and one of the thing about, uh, things about Philip King, who is now sadly dead, of course, um, is that he had an imaginative element always in his work, which sometimes took him outside the, um, not the rules, but the way other other people worked. And, and this is what I loved about him. Mm -hmm. And he, he always continued to do that in his work throughout his life. Mm -hmm. He remained totally and completely himself, I think. Thank you. We'll move on to the next piece. Um, yeah. yeah, this is, this is, again, is made out of a found object. The curved piece to the left um, and the round uh, stand that it's on is actually a, a piece of ducting from a large central heating interior from a factory, and I found that on the skip. And I, what I did was to car, model and cast the right-hand end piece uh, and also um, the other folding end at the, the far end. This piece got into the young contemporaries and I can't remember the date. Uh, and it stood about three feet high and was five or six feet across. Mm. And it was white, it was sprayed white. Yeah. Um. I think I said before, I really enjoy that manipulation of objects and the kind of transformation yeah. into yeah. a new piece. Yes, tell us about this. This was an interesting story as well. Um, this, actually, this piece was made before the two you've just seen. Um, this was during the year I had at Chelsea, uh, where I was given a space. Um, there was no, there was, it wasn't a proper um course it was just generosity on the part of um Lawrence Gowing who had arranged this with um Kenneth Roundtree that I and Mary could have some time in London anyway again I wasn't sure what I was doing I sort of lost my way a bit but this I found a couple of old toilet seats in a skip and um using their shape um, built this um, and and again unsurely um, painted it in colours just for fun in a way um, but when one does things like this lessons are learned somehow you um, begin to think about what you've done after you've done it uh, and this way, I think you move on. And the possibility of making things, if you like, in an ad hoc way can sometimes be very important. And this doesn't exist anymore, but I have a fondness for it. I thought it was um, an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Talking about um, uh, uh, learning from experience, um, there was a particular car that you saw at the Tate Britain in 87. And, um, it uh, in, inspired the direction in your work in a particular way. Um, Caro was always, obviously, you, look, you looked over your shoulder during the time you were making it, unless, unless you were working completely away and separately in the world of figuration, and that would be something else. But if you were, a, if you like, a constructivist, or constructionist, then you could not avoid seeing, watching Caro and his extraordinary, um, you know, vociferousness in terms of producing work, um, his incredible formal imagination. Um, and I... I'd never been seriously influenced by what he did. I was admiring of it and I watched it and I never worked in steel very much at all. And so I wasn't forced to go down that road, if you see what I mean. Um, um, but I went to see a show, um, Take Britain, of his work. 
which had changed quite a lot. It was very solid, there was wood, there was uh, ceramic. Um, and I, I just, it was wonderful. I su just suddenly thought, I don't need to look at this anymore. Um, I'm, I can move away and do whatever I want. I don't have to be worried by this man. And it was a moment of um, freedom in a way. Uh, I, I mean, I still admire hugely what he, what he did, uh, but it was it was good to step away from that mm -hmm. in that world, that environment, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And moving on to the next piece, please. Uh, this was made again at Chelsea during that year, um, influenced quite a bit still by Philip. Uh, the colour I would never have imagined in my wildest dreams when I was 20, ending up painting a sculpture in sort of pretty mauve, but there it is. Um, and it's, it's constructed, and in fact, the top part flopped over from one side to the other, so you could change the form of it quite mm. substantially by pushing the, the, the left-hand bit and over the top. Okay. So again, yeah, I sorry, I felt that my year at Chelsea was fascinating and I did have an additional very interesting time because I was uh, invited to teach at Ealing College by somebody called Roy Ascot who was famous for uh, producing a very particular kind of course um, and I met some quite famous artists there Anthony Benjamin, um, other people, Brian Wall, the sculptor, and, and that was invigorating and, and very good, all part of just learning and finding out about things. Really. Yeah, these these come from my time. At, I'd, I'd moved to Norwich and um, taken over the job of building up a new sculpture course. I was still quite active sculpturally. Um, and I guess these these are the only pieces where I, I use steel as a significant part of um, the work. Um, but the, the those wings on the top are resin and the other piece that appeared um, a moment ago was also steel and resin, and and they were they were significant pieces for me. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your work um, at Norwich, developing the sculpture, of course? There. Yes, of course. Um, what happened was I I'd heard that there was a job going for that to develop a degree level course. I applied for it. I didn't get it, somebody else got it. And, but I was offered some part-time teaching in the foundation course. So that was fine. I desperately needed some work. Um, and uh, that went on for a little while, but then the, the guy who was supposed to be developing the course was not doing terribly well. And I remember the principal at the time taking me aside and saying, look, we're in a bit of a dilemma. We've got to get this recognition. Do you think you could take over? Which I did, which was very uncomfortable. The other guy was a friend of mine and he was very angry. Um, but anyway, um, we had to start from nowhere. We were given very, very good premises because the art school or the local council bought a, an old factory shop the other side of the road to the main building. And, and we were given very, very good space, uh, which was halfway there, if you see what I mean. But we had no students and we used to borrow them from other departments. And there was one boy, young man in particular, who is on foundation course, uh, Bob Catchpole, who turned out to be, uh, he was wonderful. We got him over and he made lots of work. And when Robert Adams came 
to look at the plates, we got some work and the spaces were being used and uh, we passed through with flying colours really. And then then the first year we applied, we advertised and, and so as over the 20 years I was there, the course developed and became a first choice college mm -hmm. for sculpture. Um, there was there was quite a significant gap in my sculptural existence uh, after you'd seen those fiberglass and steel pieces. Um, we bought a semi derelict cottage in the country south of Norwich for us to live in, and I I got quite involved in the restoration of that. Um, we had young family. Um, it, it was very, very difficult for me to continue working after four days at college and I um, was hard work building the course up and um, I stopped for quite a while. But towards the end of the time, um, no, sorry, in, in about... 78, I went to Norwich in 70, 78, I began to get interested in using ceramic. Um, and so um, a, a whole new stage in my sculptural life started and this, this was made around that time. And it's um, coil built, fired um, stoneware. And uh, constructed. You went to um, uh, a sabbatical and a ceramic school. That's right. Yeah. You're right. At the very end of my time at Norwich, um, I just before I left, I got a sabbatical term at a pottery, very old traditional pot pottery in um, Suffolk where I, uh, they've been known for coil building large pot. Sadly, the chap who used to do that had gone, but I did learn an, a huge amount there um, and it really uh, pushed me on. And uh, the upshot was we set up a ceramics section in the sculpture school. Mm. Um, it didn't last very long because health and safety got in the way and they said you can't do that <laughs> but I, I had actually left by then so um, and the, ne the next piece the green one um, was part of that time too um, this was made in two halves I had a kiln that would fire an 18 inches high piece um, and so I made two halves and fixed them together so it, that stands about just over a metre high. Um, and it, it, for, you know, the, my interest in form making through the process of clay, modelling and coil building, slab building of ways of making forms pushed my formal language on quite a long way, I think, really. There, there is a sort of figurative element in this. It wasn't deliberate, but it does have something of a figure in it. Yeah, and, and the same the next slide as well, I think. Yes, um, this is relatively small um, and is now in the collection of the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich. Again, um, stoneware hand-built slab, coil, whatever, to make the forms. And and I think I made the glaze from a recipe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all this craft stuff that I've been building up over the years comes comes out in all its full force in these pieces, I think. Really. And your process for these pieces in particular, did you do a lot of drawings um, prior Dr to making them? Sorry, did I do... Do you do a lot of drawings um, prior to making or from, do you get these uh, shapes from life? I, I, have, I have drawn quite a lot. I've drawn from landscape, uh, particularly um, limestone landscape, which I found 
hugely intriguing. During my um, the middle years of being on the course, running the course, we, I and my colleague Martin Welsh, we used to take first year students on a field trip to the um, the Yorkshire Moors for about a week, and we'd stay and walk and draw and photograph, and mm. always found it. They were hugely inspired by it, really. Um, I think it was a very good thing to do. Yeah. Um, I I got very enthused by certain aspects of the landscape, too. Mm, thank you. And thank I think there's influences of landscape in these. Um, you were talking about um, drawing um, in films. You start from... Yes. Um, but this is, a, this is a drawn relief, really. Um, again, influenced very strongly by rock formations. Um, I've, I've been given a, a lovely piece of Nabrasina marble. I, I wanted to do something with it. And this is based on a drawing I did on the Welsh coast. Um, not very significant object, but it, it sort of fits into my crazy journey, really. Um, Maybe. And uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Next one. Um, yes, um, around this time, um, Martin Welsh set up a foundry at Norwich, and I'd not really worked in bronze at all. Um, and this again is coloured very much by the landscape that I saw, uh, particularly in Yorkshire. Um, and it's a series of, it's a map, but a three-dimensional map, um, mm. very influenced by the, the rock formations and the water running. And so it's, so it's quite, it's quite um, descriptive in a way. Mm. What pushed you towards um, starting to work from the, the natural environment? Um, well, it was, it was, I think it was post the business of working on the cottage and, and not making. Um, I needed something to get my feet onto again. And I think I'd always loved landscape. Um, Part of the business with my father is that whenever we were on holiday, he would always be sketching, uh, and I I learned to do that too. And so, looking at landscape and drawing from it was um, quite important. Mm -hmm. And um, that that's really what happened. Uh, so for for a number of years, I was quite strongly influenced by particularly geological landscape because it's formally very strong and powerful really. Yeah. Um, the next slide, image 21 on my thumbnail. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is this is really pushing the boundaries of ceramic work. Uh, again, you can see the kind of imagery that comes from uh, water and stone, but this is a a uh, ceramic piece made from um, terracotta and has an internal space running right through from one end to the other. So it's, if you like, it's a cave, but the, um, the surface is, you know, part of what I was interested in and the drawing of the forms. Mm. Thank you. About 18 inches high, 18 inches long. Um, and we'll move move on to the next, which should be um, the, the lights here. So I think um, you started to look at working with light in your work, um, and also thinking about architectural built space. Um, yes, um, and this was a crazy piece, really, because um, I'm I'm making very geometric clean forms but they're made out of ceramic which is not the best material to do that 
um, and the light box is separate over the top, shining down inside. Um, so I was beginning to be interested in the idea of internal spaces and that lighting them could bring them to life in different ways. Um, and the geometry, um, so I was, I was moving away from the natural world and moving back into the built world, really. Um, and maybe this is the moment to talk briefly about that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd always, I'd gone to church as a, as a youngster um, and my family loved churches. They weren't religious, but they loved them um, as, as things, as objects. And I grew to love looking at the architecture of churches too. Um, and something I discovered quite early on, which I uh, have used more recently, was something called a squint, which is hard to describe, but it's, it's a sloping hole, architecturally built hole, which goes through a thick wall, joining one um, chapel with another, so that two priests could see each other officiating at a service at the same time. Difficult to describe. Big at one end, sloping at the other. Mm -hmm. so it sloped down and the effect that it gave was rather similar to, you know, when you're a child, you look down a paper tube and the world looks tighter and, and sort of more defined. And I, I like that idea. And this was just the beginning of thinking about that as a um, form mm. for making reliefs. And is it that frame in particular that you're interested in, or is it um, the way that you can see um, objects well, in other spaces? It's, it's obviously I'm, I'm interested in the thing itself because it does something. Yeah. You know, yeah. So um, what I what I go on to do now over and over again is make use that form in various ways. Even in this piece, mm. uh, that, that sloping inwards, mm. um, which defines in in a space in a in a particular way. So you you move out of the big space you're in and you're drawn into a more intimate space, which is there hanging in front of you on the wall. Thank you. Hopefully next there'll be a, a, an image of another. Yes. Um, this is pushing the light thing considerably further. The, um, the dark, part is constructed from plywood and painted white and the, the grid is specially cut perspex which I had done at a special factory and then in, in there's a box and internally there is light um, and so it it's um, again dealing with this idea of something mysterious maybe happening behind um, and and geometry is there um, holding the whole thing together really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jo, there's an image that has um, it's again the squint idea and there are several um, shapes here. Yes. Oh, the orange one. Thank you. Yes. yes, there there we go. That's it in its simplest form, really. Um, this is quite a, a, it's a plywood piece. Um, and the, the, each of the sections slopes too. So it's, uh, it's like, almost like a scale, a piece of music. Um, and the positions of the red shift up and down. So it's quite a gentle thing, but, um, and that, that, you know, I was beginning to think much more clearly about this 
and the light appears and the color brightens and um, I'm on a different road really. And worth to bear in mind that when you're in front of these physically, um, the, the angle and shadow and colors will change as you move around. Yes, yeah. all, all of the things that I've made since this time, I'm fascinated by what happens when you, you stand in the middle at the front and then you move across and you look and as you look diagonally backwards even right round till your face is almost on the wall then it changes all the time and you see new um, elements of the space. Thank you. Joe, if you move on to the next slide please. Yes, um, a little bit further on, um, this is where I'm really chucking the <laughs> baby out with the bathwater, um, trying to use colour in a way I never had before. Um, I'm not sure how successful these things are. Uh, the, um, and again, the, the, the zigzag part has silver for, um, <coughs> silver foil on it not silver foil silver leaf to reflect so the um color and the form of the side pieces are reflected back mm. so again there's an element of confusion deliberately visual confusion although it's very clear in one respect it's also um very unclear in others and i i like that um where do you get your um, grid shapes from as well? Are they something... Sorry, where do I get the... Your, your grid, there are quite a lot of grids that appear in, in some of your later works. I'm just wondering if they are from a particular... No, they, they're just really there to break one's visual journey, you know, mm -hmm. looking through. Mm -hmm. um, and it... It's a it's a quite a mechanical way, I suppose, mm -hmm. of making a barrier, you know. Um, and in this piece, for instance, just the fact that it's standing away from the wall and a spatial element is there, quite simple. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have been part of uh, this business of trying to break down what you, what what you see in front of you. And talking about walls as well, have, um, have you ever made anything that uh, sits in uh, with the, the boxes and the grids? So there's anything that's in a space, not against a wall? Or is that something that you've thought about doing? Sorry, in a space, do you mean? Yeah, yes. Like in, in a, a doorway or a window frame? Yes, or? yes. I, I never have, actually. Quite, it's quite a good idea. Thank you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. It's um, I've always, uh, I suppose it's such a funny journey working on the wall. Um, people say, "Oh, well, you're not a proper sculptor. You're not making proper sculpture." They they don't count really. But uh, you know, they are. They can. It continues to fascinate me what you can achieve visually in the space that exists around us every day, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll move on to the next, Joe. All right, this was, a, this was quite a breakthrough, this piece. Um, I'm sort of trying colors more radically. Um, I've taken the the rhomboid shape and laid one on top of another um, and then the background one is filled in with the pale blue so um, yeah I this this was this was quite successful it appeared in an exhibition I had 2019 at Mandel's and um, it was I, I believe it was on poster and the lady came up from Ipswich and stood outside on the door 
waiting for the gallery to open and walked in and said, I will have that. So it's the fastest sale I've ever had. So it's quite, nice. it's quite pretty. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. And what kind of size is it? Um, about, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, about 60 centimetres tall. And, you know, consequently, whatever size would come from that. Yeah, I, I was always quite pleased with that. Move on to the next slide. Um, and again, this this is um, some of these boxes I filled in. Some of them are not. Uh, and I think probably what was going on here is I'm I just I'm so ignorant about color how what it's for and how you use it and what it means, but. You know, I was I was just chanting my arm and experimenting and seeing what happened. Mm. Um, and it's a column, so it's not against the wall. It's okay. actually <laughs> it's actually free freestanding. So, yeah. And um, these colours that you're experimenting with, where, um, where did you uh, get them from? Were they from a particular? Um, well, place? some I. I quite often make collages to begin with, um, well, I almost always make collages, and I do use some Fabriano papers because the colours are lovely, but I also paint my own paper as well, so it's a combination, and the more I do it, the less I use Fabriano as I, as I learn more mm. about how colour works and what it can do. Mm. Um, so I I felt a bit of a cheat when I first started with Fabriano because the colours are lovely and you only have to shuffle them around and they look pretty good. <laughs> so uh, I think I've moved on from there a bit. Thank you. Move on to the next. Um, so this is a watercolour? Watercolour towards a print. Mm -hmm. um, um, I got interested in this this business of layering and ideal proposition would be to make uh, prints, simple prints, and uh, I've made a number of those uh, to, with a, a very fine printmaker um, who used to run the printmaking department at Norwich, Mel Clark. Mm. And he he made. Could you move on? Yeah. Yeah. His this is one of his. Um, it's my it's my my print, but he did the all the hard work on mm. the computer screen to get it to this point. Mm. Um, and they, and they were they were just dealing with the same sort of ideas of. Layer, layering and of um, disjointedness and uncertainty about what is really going on, and that continues to There's interest There's a lot me. of movement in this one. Sorry? There's a lot of movement in, in this one. Yes, 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 indeed, there is. And still. <laughs> yes, and, and the next one too, I think. Yeah. 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 And the grid, the grid thing was very much part of these, um, and uh, it's it's just yes, just to say something um, that I'd forgotten about. A very good friend of of ours, Christina and mine, and a very good friend of Mary Webb's, Marta Stevens, um, so many years ago, bought a wonderful water mill in a village in the Pyrenees called Mosset and we stayed there a number of times and the village is full of windows and doorways that have got barriers across them for mm. some reason or another and I, I spent a whole day photographing these um, these windows uh, and they had wood or metal or 
mesh or rods or um, just an extraordinary collection of marvellous images, really. Mm. And I think these were influenced by that. Oh, thank you. Moving on to the next. Just, uh, yeah. Um, collage, is it? Yes, collage. Yeah. And I think this was one where I made my own colours this time. So. Um, are you working towards um, a sculpture here, or are you? Is this um, a piece in a piece in itself, or is it working towards? Oh, I I think I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever made a piece quite like this. Mm -hmm. and some sometimes they're just things in their own right. I mean, I just make them, and um, sometimes they turn into reliefs, and sometimes not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next one. That's another one. Um, I I mean, this has not been turned into. Um, a relief. And have you used the silver the foil again on, on this piece? Um, no, but I do think that the two dark, the sort of brownie coloured ones are actually gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's lovely. Lots of movement in, in that one too. Mm, <laughs> cool. Rust, rustling in the breeze almost. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, well, the last two images, um, I'm hoping, <laughs> are some very recent images yes. that you've been working on. Um, this, this is a combination of um, shifting spaces, um, changing the volume of forms, some solid, some empty, some with a flat bottom, so you you get and and the frame is silver to reduce its um, power, if you like, in, as part of the piece. Um, colors just um, fairly carefully worked out. I think th I did call a, a couple of pieces like this, and there's two collages, one for each. So. The colours was partially worked out, but then, of course, when you do the the thing itself, it comes out differently. So, thank you. Yeah, that's about eight, um, twenty, no, thirty, thirty-five, forty centimeters high. Not very large. Okay. And again, you can imagine um, the shift in kind of colour and shade as you move around that yes piece. absolutely it changes a lot yeah thank you can you move on to the next slide um this this one it's very hard to read it from the photograph um there are obviously small blue oblongs in the background but the actual red forms slope backwards and forwards so the surface is an uneven zigzag if you like um, so as you can see you can see part of the yellow then disappears then another part um, that's about again about 30 centimeters they're not not very large um, and I just I just find so much territory still to explore, really. And this you're creating something that's incredibly complex. Is is that something that you'd like to continue to explore? Um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, the next one um, is is i made two, no, I've made only one more since then. And they they have got, this is a, a photograph with a wide angle lens, by the way, which is why you can see into the outside boxes as well. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I'm not sure about this piece. Um, but um, yeah, complexity is, 
something that interests me. Um, there'll come a point when they get so complex you won't be able to see anything. <laughs> so I guess then, then I have to move back from there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Derek, I think we've just about um, run yeah. out of time. So yeah. it's, thank you so much. You have done so much um, throughout your career as a, a sculptor and you've really pushed the boundaries of materials and pushed your ideas through so many different um, media. And it's been really, really wonderful uh, exploring that journey uh, through talking thank you. to you. Thank you so much. I'm thank going you. to open up any questions to the audience so if you would like to write any questions in the chat um and i will ask derek Silence. i'm going to ask you a question myself are there any materials that you haven't um explored that you still any, like to? <laughs> any, any materials i think so <laughs> yes i think so yeah um i haven't and i, I have no intention of I'm not going to move on now and start something special and different again. Mm. Um, I've, I've reached a, a kind of point of elite, equilibrium, I think, really. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I have the energy to keep changing now. Mm. Mm. And uh, your most recent book um, is very, uh, yeah, geometric. Uh, man-made again do you think there will be a point where you return to the natural environment are you interested in readdressing I don't, I don't think so mm. no I don't think so yeah. um, no questions no everybody's, questions everybody's <laughs> oh, okay it's eight o'clock I'm going to say thank you so much Thank you, Derek. And I apologise for the slight technical hitch this evening. Um, big apologies for that. But um, I've really, really enjoyed uh, being with you and learning about your uh, incredible career um, it's, as an artist. It's, thank, you. thank you. It's been really great doing it. And thank you very much for asking me. Thank you. I'll say thank you and good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And see Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.